Welcome to the Prosperity Kitchen podcast. I'm your host, Gemma McRae, and I'm so, so happy you're here. I'm a life coach, I'm a small business coach, I'm an author, and I'm a podcaster. And every week I bring you a podcast on a topic based on happiness, success, or health for either you or for your small business. If you haven't already done so, then pop over to my website, prosperitykitchen.co.uk and download my free, yes, free book on instant happiness. Finally, if you love this podcast, which I know many of you do, then I would be so, 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 so grateful if you could leave me a ratings and review on iTunes. So now for the podcast. Enjoy. Hi everyone, it's Gemma here. Today's podcast is with a doctor of immunology, Dr. Jenna. In the podcast, she tells us the four main things that affect our immune system. She gives us her top 10 tips for keeping our immune systems in shape, which there are a few cool surprises in there. And we have a general chit chat and she brings up some super duper, super duper, super duper interesting facts. For example, she confirms that a lack of sleep is directly linked to cancer. She talks about the benefits of intermittent fasting and how it works, by the way. Um, And she talks about how high intensity exercise can actually be bad for your health, not good. She also gives me her thoughts on autoimmune diseases and diets. She's a super educated woman. She knows her stuff. If you don't have time to listen to the whole podcast, then just skip straight to 25 minutes and 54 seconds where she will give you your her top 10 tips for keeping your immune system in tip-top health. So with no further ado, I hand you over to Dr. Jenna. Enjoy. Good morning, Jenna. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well, thank you. I'm very excited to be interviewing you. That's great. It's my favourite subject. (laughs) Yeah. Now, before we go into what you do professionally, Mm -hmm. um, could you tell the Prosperity Kitchen podcast listener um, what a bit a bit about you personally? Okay. Yeah. Sure. So my name is Jenna Machoki. It's really awkward to spell that second name. Um, I'm from Scotland originally. I grew up in a little tiny um, village, not even in a village, in a farm about a mile from a tiny village in the middle of rural Scotland. And um, I look back now and I think that was probably an idyllic childhood. But at the time, I couldn't wait to leave. I was excited (laughs) by the city. So um moved to Glasgow lived there for a while moved to London lived there for a while moved to Switzerland lived there for a while and then two years ago I moved back to the UK and I'm currently in Brighton um where I live with my husband and we have twins (gasps) um a boy and a girl who are three and a half so life is pretty (laughs) full (laughs) on I bet it is um (laughs) lots of fun but lots of work (laughs) yeah I'm so not ready for these sleepless nights that are coming. But anyway, um, could you tell us what you do professionally? So professionally, I'm an immunologist, uh, which means I basically study everything about the immune system. So when I was at when I was leaving school and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, um, I was always, always fascinated by the human body and health and disease. I don't know where that came from don't know why but that was what I was interested in and um, I went off to Glasgow University because it was the only university in the UK that that offered a degree just in the immune system and I thought this was amazing this was like I'd found my people this was what I wanted to do and um, from there I was hooked so since the age of like 17, 18, that's what I've been studying Um, and then I went on to do PhD uh, at Imperial College in the immune system and um, is what I've been working on ever since. Currently, I'm a lecturer at Sussex University. So that's uh, down here in Brighton. And um, I teach 
all the different life science degrees, medical, pharmaco- um, pharma- pharmacy students about the immune system. And then I also get to do some little research projects as well on the side. So Yeah. I mean, you're being very humble. You're a very, very, very qualified, clever lady. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I suppose now that, um, you know, I'm in my late 30s, I kind of reflect and think, wow, I have spent a whole chunk of my life like really immersed in this subject area and I feel like the public interest in the immune system has never been higher yeah they're really like everybody's talking about the immune system they're boosting the immune system you know they're taking their whatever pills for their immune system and and sometimes it really is my little bugbear because I'm like do you even know what you're talking about I know I can imagine because I think so many people are ill nowadays because of stress, actually. Yes. Um, yeah. Which I'm sure we get on to. But because um, you are, are you a medical doctor? Because you're obviously you're a doctor. Yes, I'm a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor in a clinical setting. No. So, yeah. No. Okay. Um, you've come on this podcast to talk about the human body's immune system. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really want to take this back to the basics so um, please don't get frustrated but Mm -hmm. um, we're not as super clever as you are so could you explain to me and the listener exactly what our immune system is and why it is so important so our immune system is as the name suggests it's a whole system so it involves different organs in our bodies things like our lymph nodes our bone marrow our thymus and it involves a whole galaxy of cells and molecules. So these organs, cells and molecules are all talking to each other and all collaborating to protect us from infection. And I think one of the key things to know about the immune system is that we're not born with an immune system. It's made as we enter the world and um, it, it evolves with our environment. So it's very much talking to our environment, influenced by our environment. And when we're, we're born, our immune system is really quite immature. And for the first few months of life, we rely on the antibodies that we got through our mothers. Um, this also transferred through breast milk. And after six to eight months, this starts to, to wane and we start to develop our own immune system. And, and it's really a process that goes on through our life. And we have all these cells and molecules which really act like on and off switches so we often think about inflammation as being one of the key um weapons that the immune system uses to fight infections but as much as we need that inflammation we also need lots of off switches to switch it off and keep us in uh in balance um when we're not fighting infection is that, is that because of the autoimmune diseases that are around you're talking yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so th- the reason that we have all these different cells and molecules, we have such a, an array of, of different components of the immune system is because the things that we're exposed to in our environment that might make us sick are so varied that we're basically trying to cover all bases, you know, trying to give us as much breadth as possible in our defence against what we might come across. But at the same time, the more diverse your immune system the more chance that you might react against things that don't actually make us sick so that would be the case for autoimmune diseases our immune system starts to react against ourselves or in the case of allergies we start to react against things that are not actually dangerous to us so things like pollen um if you have hay fever Mm. so it's kind of a balance it's um i think it's the compromise that you get for being able to protect yourself from all the different infectious agents is that sometimes these things spring up so i must get you back on to talk about autoimmune diseases then actually that's just a light bulb went off um wow so okay so we're not born with an immune system it develops interesting okay where does our immune system actually live where is it in our bodies so as I said, it's a whole galaxy of cells and molecules, and a lot of these are circulating in our blood, mm-hmm. uh, in and out of the blood and the lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system is a bit like our blood system, that it just carries lymph fluids with cell with immune cells in it, all around the body, in and out the lymph nodes, and it's constantly surveilling our body, checking to see if there's anything that um, 
that might cause us an infection. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We also have uh, the bone marrow uh, where all our immune cells are being made. So there's a constant um, efflux of immune cells out of the bone marrow and into the circulatory system. This is happening all the time. Uh, we have T cells, which are one of the immune cells that are developing in the thymus. So this is a little gland that sits in the neck. And they're as well all constantly being released into the circulatory system. Mm -hmm. And then lining every barrier to our environment. So the skin, the nasal tract, the respiratory tract, our intestines, anywhere that we're exposed, we have a whole um, repertoire of different immune cells that sit there. And these are the cells that set off the alarm bells ringing if something was to break that barrier. So if you cut yourself uh through your skin, there'll be cells that are just sitting there below the skin that will signal that there's some danger, that we need more immune cells to come along to help repair, to help remove any bacteria that might have got in there. That's Do you know what? That's really embarrassing because I actually thought what you were going to say was in the blood and the white blood cells. And you've actually gone on to list a whole plethora of of, of things yes <laughs> just shows and I'm I mean I'm I mean I'm not an expert by any means but I did a level biology I kind of know the basics and um wow I didn't realize it was that extensive yes yeah it's it's really really huge we have sort of two arms of the immune system that the innate which is thought to be more like first line defense so those are the ones that might be lining the the surfaces of your body mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. we have the adaptive which takes a little bit of time to to develop when it's needed but it's much stronger and much more specific so we kind of have the you know the first line defense and then we have the adaptive that comes in later and it's it's much more powerful if something overwhelms our, our first line defenses but yeah the immune system is really really everywhere Huge. yeah yeah. What controls it or who controls it? <laughs> well, <laughs> what a question. Um, it's con it, it's controlled by all manner of different um, on and off switches. Uh, it's really hard yeah, to explain know where to start. Yes. Mm. Um, so these innate cells that line all the surfaces of our body, these have um, receptors on their surface that respond to things that are common commonly found on infectious agents so things that we often find on bacteria or viruses and this will set them off if they come in contact with that but they also contain receptors that respond to damage so if you have a cut or some kind of um, trauma to the tissue this also activates them to be set off um, mm -hmm. and some of these cells once they they have that first um, alarm bell ringing they'll go to talk to the cells of the adaptive immune response. These are circulating in our blood and our lymph nodes. And they'll transmit to them the, the message that some, there's an infection in a certain area of the body. Mm -hmm. And those cells then become activated and they um, will produce an army of themselves. So they, they um, proliferate into this huge army and go to the site where they're needed, where they can really exert their powerful effect. I'm sensing it's very complicated and it's quite frustrating for you to quite explain it. So let's move yeah. on. Um, why why do some people have better immune systems than others, Jenna? What what's the reason? I think this is a really interesting question, um, <laughs> and I think that uh, the immune system is really really different person to person. Uh, I think even within identical twins. The immune system is quite different. Uh, so although we're born with a certain genetics, um, because our immune system is developed by our environment, it really may means that each one of us has a unique immune system. So each one of us would respond differently to the same infection. So if we all got given the same common cold, some of us would really uh, not fare so well and others wouldn't get very sick at all. Just because of those differences, um, and the fact is that we're all different is to be able to try and manage the broad array of different infections we might come across. There's one aspect um, that does have a big influence on how we respond and, and how our immune system works. And that's this thing called the major histocompatibility uh, complex. Ooh, what, what, sorry, the major 
major histocompatibility complex. I'm going to start term. putting that into conversation now to sound very exactly. clever. <laughs> they, the, the MHC, the major histocompatibility, they're basically genes that um, the products of these genes are receptors that um, can switch our immune system on. But because they're all, we, we, we're all very different, they're a very diverse set of genes, it means that some people's immune systems will have MHC. That means they can really see that infection really easily and start fighting it straight away. And other people's MHC, just by chance, the immune system can't see it so well. So it's it's how our genetics are influencing um, how we respond to infection. And another little interesting fact about the MHC is that it influences a lot of different aspects of our biology. So they've done a lot of studies showing that you know, uh, how we choose our partners, a lot yeah. of it got to be due to pheromones and smell. Yeah. And they've looked at um, people's preferences on, on people's pheromones and found that they tend to prefer a partner who has a much more different MHC genetic makeup to their own. So therefore, by mating with that person, they're increasing the diversity, keeping the population outbred, as you were, if you will, and that helps with our defence against infection. So, wow. So, sorry. So, the the it's called major histocompatibility. Yeah. And you're saying that just in mating, for example, they've studied this and they've said that um, it's it's been proven. I think you just said that we go for the person with the opposite kind of MHC. Yes, yeah. Ooh, interesting. And this to then if you were to have a child with that person, you're you're um giving the child your own genetic makeup and also that of someone with a very different MHC. Yeah. So the child will hopefully have a better chance of defending infection. So Yeah, it's about covering <laughs> all the bases. Yeah. It also influences things like the success of pregnancy. So um uh, when miscarriages happen that is because the immune system is mounting a response against the fetus, which is uh, genetically different from the mother because it has ge- the genes from the father. And the MHC is all t- the way that the immune system sees these differences. So it plays quite a huge role, but it's probably something that's not been so much talked about or recognised for quite a long time. Yeah, sorry. I'm, I'm like a codfish at the end <laughs> of my microphone because... Um, I don't know if you know this, I had quite a long fertility journey and I interviewed, oh, no. yeah, and I interviewed a, a few fertility doctors and um, nobody ever mentioned, you know, the fact that your part, your partner compatibility could yeah. be an issue to do with miscarriages. Yeah, I mean, interesting. It's not so well recognised, but then, I mean, it's a difficult one because... Right. Do you want to choose your partner? Yeah. <laughs> Genetically, you work well together. It's, yeah, it's, it, but it's, it's, I guess, understanding more about it, then we can find ways to manage it. So if you knew that was the reason for multiple miscarriages, you might be able to, there'd be some kind of intervention that you could do to help the success of the pregnancy. But, yeah. Um, it's, it's a valid point. I understand wow that's very interesting um so many things to say on that but we must move on um Mm -hmm. what factors can affect our immune system well just about everything (laughs) um because as i said the immune system is not something we're born with but it develops throughout our life so uh there's so many ways that our immune system can be shaped by our environment i think the classic ones that we all think of would be things like antibiotics yeah these have a huge effect on our immune system and also vaccinations so vaccination is is forcing your immune system to produce a response so that later on you're protected if you ever encounter that particular infection Mm -hmm. these are like the classic ones i think something that um is really a growing area of study at the moment is things like um, sleep and the circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. This seems to exert quite strong regulatory influence on our immune system, particularly with something called immunological memory. So this is the, the way that if we see an infection, we respond to it 
And then we retain a kind of memory uh, population of cells that are waiting in case we see it again. Right. So they, what they've shown is that if you have a, a vaccination in the morning rather than the afternoon, you seem to get a much better memory response. So then later on, if you're exposed to that um, virus or bacteria that you've been vaccinated against, you'll have a better response. Interesting. This is quite, um, it's quite preliminary, but I do think that it's something that could be quite simple to implement into something like the NHS. If you know that somebody, like an elderly person, whose immune system was not so good, you want to give them a flu vaccine, just by doing it in the morning, they might have a better response than if you did it late in the afternoon. But as I said, it's quite preliminary, so we need to kind of get a bit more evidence to support it before it could be implemented. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're saying vaccinations, antibiotics and sleep affect our immune system. Yeah. What else? Uh, I think the other big one that's, um, having a bit of a moment at the at the moment is stress. Mm. So this whole mind body interaction that we're really starting to to study and uh, unravel at the moment, and stress is in um, at the end of the day it's a physiological response. So although we feel it emotionally and psychologically, there are um, biochemical pathways and and molecules being released when we get stressed. Um, and these can act directly on our immune system um, to lower the function and the number of immune cells. So there's been some evidence about that. But also stress might uh, indirectly affect our immune system because it might make us um, have some more unhealthy behaviours. So withdrawing or not going outdoors or, you know, not doing things that um, that help us to manage the stress. Um, but again, it's quite a preliminary area, it's something that's been quite neglected um, while we've been trying to really understand the, the immune system. Mm -hmm. And I think the final one is is nutrition. Yes. Um, this is something that I've worked in uh, in my own um, career. It's something that I'm really interested in. And I think with, with all things, it comes down to, to balance being the sort of most difficult place to, to stand because... Um, the immune system is needs to be in balance with all these on and off switches and to do all the different biochemical processes that it needs to do to function it needs a balanced diet so a lot of the nutrients in our diet support all the different functions of the immune system so. are, are you as a doctor of immunology are you are you do you believe in uh, gluten-free, dairy-free and things like that? Do you believe that a diet can affect autoimmune diseases? I mean, that's quite a big question or questions, but just generally. I think we don't know enough about it. it it's, I mean, I'm obviously in my professional career, I have to come from an evidence-based perspective. So we have to do really well-controlled studies to be able to conclusively say um, whether something does or doesn't. But I do think that there's a high volume of anecdotal um, stories that can't be dismissed in a way. You know, there's been many people who've had super um, results by modulating their diet without, you know, doing it without any sort of nutritional or dietitian um, giving them advice. They've just, like you say, removed dairy and found that it helped with their symptoms. Um, so we can't ignore that, but I think we're not quite there yet in terms of understanding what the mechanism is. And by re removing something from your diet, although it might make you feel better, it's often hard to pinpoint what it is about that thing that's not making you, that, that might be contributing to how you feel. And we can't really ignore the placebo effect as well. So mm. the, the fact that you feel like you're taking action and, you know, you might have had a situation where your doctor couldn't help you, you've been to various different healthcare practitioners and no one could help you. So now you've done your own research and you've removed something from your diet and you're starting to feel better. But it could be just empowering that you feel like you're, you know, getting yourself informed and, and doing something about um, a symptom that you have. So it's very difficult to say. I think we can't ignore it, but we probably just don't know enough yet. It's early days. R remind me, I need to send you the podcast to listen to which you will find interesting with 
a nutritional scientist that I interviewed oh, way wow. back at the beginning. And he's yeah. an autoimmune specialist. Yeah. Um, I'd be very interested to know what you think about what he says, because he did actually really help me. Um, oh, anyway. Um, I, do, I mean, just one more thing on nutrition. I, I don't know if taking stuff away from the diet is always the best effect, but I do think that adding stuff in, that there is evidence that this could be um, effective yeah. for helping certain conditions. And it's also the fact nowadays that food, you know, isn't, it isn't pure. You know, yes. Often what we're buying, it's kind of common sense. You yeah. know, if you're going to go and buy fruit and veg, um, unfortunately, most of it has been sprayed into an inch of its life with chemicals. Yeah. You know, what is that doing to our systems? Yeah. Um, it, it's a really interesting topic. Anyway, um, your top tips for keeping our immune system in the best shape. I'm so excited to hear what you're going to say on this. What are they? Well, it's over to you. Some of the things that I've already touched on. Um, and I do think it's, um, yeah, it kind of boils down to things that probably we already know about, but it could be quite maybe empowering to know that these have, quite strong effects on our immune system so yes what I mentioned um, earlier about sleep so we know that having reduced sleep um, reduces the function of uh, our immune cells in particular something called the natural killer cells so natural killer cells uh, as the name suggests they go around and they kill cells which have got infected with a virus but they also kill cells that might have become transformed so that means they've gone down the path to being a cancerous cell wow so they're all the time going around our body carrying out a sort of surveillance and picking off and killing any cell that looks like something's not right with it so it's got a virus inside it it's become transformed and we know that reduced sleep reduces the function of these nk cells wow is that I'm sorry to interrupt you, Jenna. So you're saying, and I'm sure it's not as straightforward as this, and as a, as a doctor, you're going to probably caveat it, but lack of sleep can, can be a cause of cancer. I mean, I, yeah, I guess I would be reluctant to put it that yes. uh, black and white, but we know <laughs> from the research studies that, we've, uh, that have been done that, it, that reduced sleep does reduce the function of these natural killer cells. And we know that these natural killer cells, one of their roles is to protect us from viral infection and the other role is to protect us from developing cancer. Wow. So the World Health Organization actually has put um, shift work uh, down as a, a carcinogen. I don't know what grade, but I can't remember. I have to look it up. But basically re- not only reducing sleep, but altering your circadian rhythm seems to have a really strong effect on these nk cells wow i did not know that sorry the world health organization has actually said that shift work wow yeah people that work night shifts it's actually um a carcinogen because we now know that this um, playing around with our circadian rhythm has such a strong effect on on the body so it's really interesting it's all quite kind of a new emerging area so one of the, the frustrating things about research is that, we, you know, we do all this research and we find out all this cool stuff, but it takes quite a long time for it to filter down. Be approved. Help the, help the general population. So yeah. I do feel like we're at a turning point and hopefully now, you know, there's a lot of push towards lifestyle medicine. Um, so hopefully that, you know, it will get to, to help the general population. Yeah. Okay, tip number one was sleep. Yeah, tip number two is stress. So, again, mentioned that earlier, but um, elevated stress hormones, cortisol, these kind of things, these can affect the function of our immune cells. So, that would be my second tip. Um, And the third tip is the really boring, but we all know it, is exercise. And not just like, your high intensity, you know, blasting it out at the end of the day um, after sitting at your desk all day, but just a low, constant 
level of activity through the day, um, we actually find that the two extremes of being sedentary and also um, is working out too much or the level of like elite athletes, it really elevates your susceptibility to, to getting respiratory infections. And just having somewhere in the middle where you're always active, you're always moving, this seems to be the best um, for keeping us healthy and avoiding infections. Sorry, can you just repeat that? I, I, I kind of didn't drift off, but I was listening to you, but I was writing a note. Did you just say, you said constant low impact activity, which, which again makes perfect common sense. Mm-hmm. Did you just say that high sort of intensity stuff done by athletes has been proven to contribute towards respiratory problems? Yes, yeah, um, to uh, increase your susceptibility to respiratory infection. Mm. So like colds and flu viruses, that kind of thing, as much as being sedentary as well. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, so I carry on, Jenna. So my fourth top tip would be avoid any products which claim to boost your immunity. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> always be sceptical. <laughs> Go on, explain. What should we be always, doing? Our, our immune system is always producing new immune cells and the old ones are dying. And we've always got this constant flow. And we really don't know yet how many or what is, is optimal for an individual. So whilst most many of the products, maybe they do help, but I just think save your money. There's not enough evidence. What kind of things are you talking about? You don't have to name brands, but what oh, kind of oh. products... I don't know. There's always these kind of things coming out that are immune boosting stuff. powders and stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, um, and that comes on to my next point, which is the diet. So um, we all know that we need to eat well and blah, blah, blah. Um, but now we do know that there are particular micronutrients. So that's like, you know, the vitamins, minerals, things that are that our immune system does use in order to carry out its functions. So um, the colourful fruits and veg, these have a lot of antioxidants and a lot of the inflammatory pathways that the immune system uses produce um, oxidation. So antioxidants counteract this, help bring it back down to normal. Mm -hmm. Colourful fruits and vegetables also contain polyphenols. Mm -hmm. So this is um, a huge area of investigation now because polyphenols are a a big group of chemicals that we find in colourful fruits and vegetables and many other things as well. And they've got really powerful anti-inflammatory properties. Okay. Um, Some people have likened it to to taking an anti-inflammatory drug um, because we really have been underestimating how powerful they are. And I don't know if you're aware, but a lot of um, lifestyle-related diseases, so metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, a lot of these things, we find that the patients have a low-grade inflammation in their bloodstream all the time. And this seems to be at the core of what's causing all their symptoms. And polyphenols are being investigated as, as a way of, of dampening this unruly inflammation and helping deal with all these um, um, more lifestyle-related diseases. Ooh, so if my father, for example, he suffers badly from fibromyalgia, yeah, formerly polymyalgia, polyphenols would be a good thing for him then, wouldn't, is that right? Yes, yes exactly, yeah. Interesting. Okay, yeah, sorry. So five is diet. Yeah. So the next thing uh, on the same theme as diet, but I would put it as a fact on its own, is fiber. Yeah. So I, um, when I was working in Switzerland, I was working on the role of fiber in our diet and the immune system. And what's interesting is when we eat a meal, we get something called postprandial epithelial permeability which basically means we get a leaky gut mm. and it's after the meal happens, postprandial, and it's a normal physiological response. So you'll find online things about cure your leaky gut. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's a normal physiological response to a meal, but things like fiber in our diet is broken down by our good bacteria and uh, releases short chain fatty acids. And these 
short chain fatty acids basically seal the, the gut up again. So the gut gets leaky, it helps the, the things we're digesting go through, also other things go through, and this ends up in our blood. We get this transient um, inflammation in our blood postprandial after our meal, and then the fiber helps seal it all up again until the next time we eat. So sorry, Jenna, again, I'm sorry to keep interrupting, but this is just no, so interesting. Okay. Yeah, because there's a massive industry now saying that leaky gut is um, is a bad thing, um, and they recommend what is it? I can't remember what it's called. The powder that closes it up. But anyway, you're saying actually that is a natural response. It, it's, it's yeah, and some foods make your gut more leaky than others. So yeah. um, fat, for instance, tends to make it more leaky, and then fiber tends to seal it up again. So. Yeah, the different foods have different effects. It's a normal part. It's sort of like um, a compromise that you get when you, you give your body this huge load of foods. And that's when maybe um, you know that a lot of our immune system is in the gut. So it's kind of like a balance. And yeah, if we eat a good diet with lots of different fruits and vegetables and fiber it, it seals the gut back up again and there's no problem and we can deal with this transient inflammation which is just caused because things are going through the gut and into the bloodstream so it's as they're meant to yeah as they're meant to and it's very transient but if you think about if you're eating all day every day this is happening all the time yeah and what foods would you consider good fiber jenna well all of the sort of whole grains and any sort of fibrous fruit and vegetables. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, lentils, beans, pulses, chickpeas, mm -hmm. all those kind of things. Okay, good. Okay, so number six was fibre. Number seven? Uh, blah, 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 let's see what I wrote down. Um, so the, the other thing, then following on again from that, is to eat defined meal times and um, play around with periods of intermittent fasting my husband's doing that at the moment actually uh, go on what's your view so again following on from my last point about when I explained that you eat a meal and you get this transient inflammation caused by the leaky gut if you're eating all the time you're going to have this process happening all the time um and if you're eating at meal times, then you know you allow your body to go back to normal before the next meal and then it happens again. And intermittent fasting, I think is having a bit of a moment uh, just now uh, with a lot of public interest in it. But I feel like I've been going to conferences and talking to peers for you know 15 years now and <laughs> hear, hearing people talk about intermittent fasting in, in their research and how they've found it really powerfully effective for all different conditions so um muscular degeneration neurodegeneration um there's a whole um body of research that supports it. it i think when we go through these periods of fasting a lot of this, the genetic switches in our body change and it allows our body to to switch on a lot of this what's known as autophagy so we start to you know the cells have a, a point where they can just clean up everything and sort of get back to normal before they go on and do their function again. So I do think intermittent fasting is really important. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's, yeah, it's not f something that people probably find easy to just introduce into their day-to-day -day life, maybe if they don't have any uh, prior knowledge to it. So I think a good kind of rule of thumb is to have your last evening meal and then wait 12 hours until breaking your fast with breakfast and that gives your body a nice period of time perfect perfect brilliant so meal times are important and you're advocating in, in intermittent fasting if it's done properly um yeah. any other tips uh so i think um my sort of medicinal foods that i would say that are worth including are things that support a microbiome so all the probiotics prebiotics because the, the if we don't have a good microbiome we don't have a good immune system yeah what we know now is that you know we're born pretty much sterile in the in the womb and in the first five years of life we get colonized with all the things that are around us 
things that passed on from our parents. And as we're colonized, these waves of, of colonization of our good bacteria, this influences the development of the immune system. So if you don't, if you, um, there's been studies done in animals where they take animals in a sterile environment. So they're born sterile and they keep them in a sterile environment and they do not have an immune system. They need, the, the immune system needs to talk to the good bacteria in order to become developed um, and to, to develop properly. So we need to take care of that. And I think um, things like antibiotics have a real effect on our microbiome. To what degree, we still don't understand. Yeah. But I think for a long time, there was maybe an overuse or an inappropriate use of antibiotics. Definitely, if you live in the Middle East, which I oh, did really? for a while, yes. Ah, that's interesting. They're handed out like tablets. Um, it yeah. wreaked havoc on, on my system. Um, then, you know, they were, when they were developed, several decades ago it was just like wow this is amazing yeah. you know this is going to change the face of um, how we treat people with infections and now we're sort of dealing with the consequences of yeah. that it's always like pendulum swings to each extreme and I think there's a lot of initiatives to have responsible prescribing of antibiotics um, and to uh, some a more awareness of whether people actually think they need them or not so yeah really important um, when, Jenna when you say the probiotics are in the prebiotics um, I assume you're talking about the actual foods as opposed to taking supplementation yeah I think um the probiotic supplements are are, are um, also a good way to go if you really think that you have a problem with your uh, microbiome or if you have had a course of antibiotics or something um I think again like the immune system the microbiome in our gut is like a vast uh, array of different populations of bacteria and viruses and other microorganisms. And you're taking a probiotic that might have one or two strains. And we just don't know if they if they do any good. If they exactly. Have, but they might have really good effects for one person, yeah. but not for another person. And if you think that our immune systems are all different uh, because of our environment, our, equally, our microbiomes are all different because they develop depending on what we're exposed to, where we live, you know, what we eat. You can really change your microbiome by changing your diet over a couple of weeks. So, what? They, sorry, yeah, sorry, Jen. What? Which, which foods would you recommend? I mean, prebiotics is raw onion. Is that prebiotic? It is. It doesn't have to be to be raw. I mean, obviously. Um, any any fibrous foods, fruits and vegetables, legumes, these are all going to feed um, our, our good bacteria and they're going to thrive on it. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just really trying to incorporate a real good variety of different fruits, vegetables, greens. These are the stuff that is going to help all the good bacteria really, really get going. So. Okay, okay. So number eight was probiotics and prebiotics. Any other tips? Um, I think the one, uh, the foods that I do think there is quite a lot of, uh, support for, um, keeping us healthy is garlic and the medicinal mushrooms. So these are the shiitake, miyake mushrooms. Ooh. And what about, you, have you heard of cordyceps before? Yes, exactly. Cordyceps. Yes. So all these kind of medicin medicinal mushrooms, they have beta glucans and various other things which are quite potent immunomodulators. So I think get those mushrooms into the diet. Garlics have this allicin, which is antibacterial. Um, so it's it's released when you really chop and crush the garlic up. So yeah, it's another good thing. Yeah. The 10th tip. The 10th tip. I don't actually this is like a personal thing and I don't actually know if it's um I don't know the science of how it affects the immune system but I just think um magnesium salts epsom salts have a bath in it um rubbing uh, magnesium oil on before bed this for me it it just helps my sleep I, feel good. I don't get um muscle pain uh, if I'm doing a lot of exercise I just find it really relaxing but not in a sort of um, lethargic way. So it's mm. my tip. <laughs> That's magnesium oil. Yeah, mag you can buy uh, oil with magnesium that you rub on the skin or taking like an Epsom salt bath. Yeah. Putting it in the bath. It's like an oldie but a goodie. I don't yeah. 
I couldn't say that it's like particularly immune boosting, but I think it's relaxing and it helps with sleep. So yeah. the bigger picture is it's going to help with everything else. And magnesium is a salt that supports a lot of different um, biochemical processes in our body. So okay, any particular magnesium oil you recommend, or as in the, the strength? Ah, uh, I could. I, I I use one from a company called Better You, but I don't know. Um, I the details the ins and outs of the different types so okay. all right um brilliant so you said for your tips um which you know a common sense um you said number one is quality sleep yeah. two is reduce your stress three is to do that constant low impact exercise four is um avoid these immune immune system boosting things because they probably don't work um five is your diet six is fiber linked to your diet seven was meal times linked to your diet eight is the use of pro and prebiotic foods in your diet the diet is just so important here <laughs> garlic and mushrooms were number nine again your diet and finally, number 10 was your advocating, as do I, by the way, um, Epsom salts and magnesium salts and, and oil, um, you're saying is personally something that you, you do. Um, those are really, really good tips. Can I ask you one left field question that I haven't put yes. before? Would you go as far as to say, Jenna, that high impact exercise is bad for your immune system then? I don't know if we have enough evidence to say it's bad for immune system. I know that the studies that they've done looking at things like cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, they do find that moving your body all the time is much better than um, sitting all day and then blasting out, you know, a 45 minute hit class in the evening. Yeah. And I, I, I'm quite interested by these blue zones of the world and, and they've, been studying them because they're areas where people a high population of people live to be 100 and older and they've tried to to link what makes them you know what's the commonalities between these areas because they're quite distinct geographic areas um and they don't often have the same diet but they've, they've sort of defined several different um rituals that these people live in their day-to-day -day life and and they, they're constantly moving their body you know exercising without actually realizing they're exercising like yeah. walking places carrying things moving doing yeah. stuff um and i do think that seems to be where the body sits it's it, it, when it's functioning optimally interesting 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 um the next question was to ask you about probiotics but you you've kind of answered that one for us already you said get them through your food as opposed to necessarily buying them because yeah, we, we don't really know what, what strains are going to be best for what people no. if it works for you and you feel good with it then then fine but I do think that yeah we don't quite know no unless you're tested all the time you don't yeah. really know where your imbalance is and what you need yeah. um finally 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 um you said right at the beginning, which again, embarrassingly, I didn't realise a baby was born with no immune system. I knew it was low. Yeah. Obviously, I'm about to give birth in the next four weeks. Um, oh, <laughs> um, thank God, because I'm very swollen. Um, <laughs> what can I do to build my baby's immune system? What should I do and what shouldn't I do? Yeah, I mean... Um... What we know from the evidence is that um, having a vaginal birth is better. And this is to do with the colonization of the good bacteria. I know it's not always possible for everyone. I mean, I had premature twins that came by cesarean section and I'm an immunologist. So you can tell I just I didn't I wanted to be having a vaginal birth because I wanted it for my baby's immune systems. But it doesn't always happen. But we know that that's the best way. Um, doesn't mean that if you don't have vaginal birth that you know you're shot but uh, also breastfeeding because as much as um, formula doesn't it's not possible for it to contain the antibodies and um, the mother's immune system that you get passed between it also helps with uh, developing the the baby's microbiome as well yep yeah, yep yeah. um obviously avoiding antibiotics unless you know it's strictly necessary 
and let let your baby get dirty you know let them <laughs> let them put mud and and stuff in their mouth <laughs> i know a lot of people will be thinking what but exposure to germs i mean there was uh, several decades ago this um chap stracken who proposed the hygiene hypothesis i don't know if that's something that you've heard of but where we get less exposure to infections, it means we seem to have let more more allergies. We seem to be the inverse relationship, and and that that hypothesis has never been strongly proven. It's more evolved into what we call like the the reduced microbiome diversity kind of hypothesis. So we think it's keeping a diverse microbiome and getting exposure to lots of different things is, is helping train our immune system and develop I'm, our I'm doing my codfish thing again because I'm <laughs> desperate to ask you something then so <laughs> I shouldn't be using or making people use antibacterial hand sanitizer when they pick up my baby then um I don't know if they've ever really studied that I mean I my instinct is to say no no I, I think a little bit right. dirty yeah and and you know when babies are getting sick their immune system's learning about their environment so yeah. it's not very nice for for baby or for parents it, you know when the baby's unwell but it's all part of the immune system developing and learning yeah. from the environment so no that's exactly what i thought but i was told something very different and i just said to my husband that doesn't seem right because yeah. surely the baby needs to be exposed to yeah a certain amount of grime and dirt and, and germs so they, they build their immune system exactly yeah they, they there are studies that i've looked at you know growing up on a farm or growing up in a, a household with lots of people they seem to have a reduced um number of allergies later on in life so we still don't quite understand the key mechanisms but there's definitely something there about the environment and stuff our immune system and then when you go to start feeding the baby solids I think just you know have a variety as much as possible think about how that food is feeding their microbiome and the microbiome is training the immune system to be strong so um yeah as, as much variety lots of fruit and vegetables and all those fibrous things that you can again those were all common sense and yeah really powerful actually um and I'm so glad and I'm saying common sense in in a um in a complimentary way um not not a derogatory way because um it, it is common sense isn't it really when you th- when you think about yeah. things <laughs> we tend to overcomplicate matters yeah I think so well I mean I feel quite lucky actually because my babies were born in Switzerland and I I um I feel like in Switzerland all the midwives and people that I had uh, interactions with were quite like just use your your intuition as a mother. Um, so I was like, okay, you know, I should you know use my intuition. Then I moved to the UK and then I felt like really bogged down with do don'ts like don't give your baby this before this age and do give them this before this age and it was all very cut and dry and and it, it just felt at odds with what you know that when my kids were born and and the way it was done in Switzerland so I do think it's really a minefield and it's really hard because you might want to go with your gut feeling but you might have healthcare professionals telling you something different and you know the the guidelines are always changing and we're always discovering new things so yeah it's really really hard yeah i i could talk to you at length about the last <laughs> point you've made another, another podcast another <laughs> podcast um right time is a ticking my dear oh. so we're going to canter on um yeah. can i ask you a few general questions yes of course um do you have a daily routine and do you have any productivity hacks oh daily routine it's something that i've done for years is just wake up and and drink um some warm water from the kettle yes with a little bit of cold in it too much of that I don't don't know when I started it but I've done it for a long time I it just makes me feel quite awake and quite nice um mm-hmm. and I do that before um before eating anything mm-hmm. my my daily routine is to my kids jump on my head at like 5 30 in the morning <laughs> quite a morning person so that's quite lucky I can normally leap out of bed and um 
I make them breakfast and drink my water while they're having their breakfast and we have a little chat. Uh, and then if it's a weekday and they're going to nursery, then we go upstairs and get dressed. And then they normally just potter and play with their toys while I'm cleaning up and making my own breakfast. <laughs> get ready for work. And um, I, as I said, I work at the University of Sussex, so I cycle. It's about four and a half miles there. So drop the kids off at nursery and cycle to work. Very healthy. Um, which is, again, I don't really get time to go to the gym. So uh, cycling to work, you know, I rack up quite a few miles by the end of the week. And, um, yeah, it keeps me in shape and stuff. And you feel uh, good when you walk through the door at work? Yeah, sometimes a little bit sweaty or in the winter a little bit cold and wet. But um, yeah, I really enjoy it. It's kind of like a moving meditation, I think, because like, I can't be on my phone, can't be talking to anyone. I'm just, you know, cycling and there's some really good cycle lanes, so I don't have too much traffic to deal with. And some pretty countryside. So it, I think it kind of sets me up for the day. As I say, I'm quite a morning person, so I really like to wake up and like get out and do something. Yeah, same here. Same here. Yeah. Um, but, 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 but what is a book or you can have books that you'd recommend to the listener to read uh, so got to have something about the immune system um, there is a professor of immunology at Manchester University called Dan Davis he used to work at Imperial College when I was there um, we were in the same building and he's written a couple of books on the immune system mm -hmm. one is the compatibility complex, I think it's called, which is about this MHC that I was mentioning. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the beautiful cure. So it's kind of like a journey through the immune system and the history of immunology. So immunology is quite a new discipline in a sense, in that in the last 20 years, we've really got the tools to be able to go in and understand it in depth. And and I guess compared to the other life sciences, it's, it's not really been and had its moment yet but I think it's definitely coming so it's definitely coming it's definitely yeah. there I think um yeah. what is your life's philosophy and what advice would you give your younger self I think my philosophy is just to to be bold um and that's definitely the advice I would give to my younger self I think some of sometimes the things that have held me back is when I've just been a bit worried about what people will think or my perceptions in my head and I think sometimes you just have to be bold and try it and that's something that definitely I got from my husband he's always telling me just just do it what's the just worst do it. Yeah. Um, yeah and what advice would you give your younger self the same advice the same advice yeah just be bold and do it and... finally where can the listeners find out more about you do you have uh, books or websites or anything like that I'm thinking uh, you website. may do Websites in development, so hopefully soon. But the best place to find me is Instagram. So I'm always um, on Instagram talking a little bit about the immune system and also just my daily life. Oh, that, what's your it, handle? It's at Dr. Underscore Jenna, J E N N A underscore Machoki, M A C C I O C H I. M A C C I O I O. C H I. Brilliant. Yes. Dr. Jenna, you have been absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm going to have to get you back on because I've yes. written about a million notes. <laughs> We'd oh. love to. It's been oh. fantastic. <laughs> you wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please pop over to iTunes and leave me that ratings and review. I will be so, so grateful. If you want to find out more about me, go to my website, which is prosperitykitchen.co.uk, or you can follow me on Facebook at Prosperity Kitchen, on Instagram at Prosperity Kitchen, or Twitter at PKL Coaching. And finally, I've got my new online course available now on my website, Five Days to a Better You. Yes, in just five days, this course will take you to a better version of yourself. So ciao for now and join me next week. Bye. La, 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 la,